Hello. Oh my gosh, everybody's already here. Hey guys. Um, all right, if y'all are stumbling upon this, my name is Bree. I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm getting ready for my night shift in the ICU. And we're going to talk all things nurse practitionering and or ICU. And today it's going to be an educational topic talking about intubation and scenarios that you can kind of mitigate. I think I titled, oh, I just titled it Intubation Starts Here. But in previous stuff that I've written, I've titled it, <laughs> Don't Let Your Patient Code When You Intubate Them, <laughs> Factors You Can Control, because there are some. Um, hey, Scott. Nurse Scott is here. Nurse Scott is an FNP student out in California going through the trials and tribulations of being a student. <laughs> Everybody pause for a moment of sympathy for all that he's going through. It's pretty rough. <laughs> um, depending on how long this goes, I have to leave early another day, another doctor's appointment. Good gosh, sir, sir. At least you're taking care of yourself. Uh, unlike some of us who refuse to get our knees MRI'd because <laughs> we don't want to know what's wrong with them. Um, Mr. Midwife, you don't know how to pronounce my last name. Shame. For shame. For shame. Uh, my last name is pronounced like this. You know, gee, she really loved that guy a whole lot to agree to that. <laughs> That's how you pronounce it. <laughs> um, his name and my name is Jaskowiak. It is Polish. And I live in the South and I did a travel assignment years and years ago in Pennsylvania. And I remember sitting at a triage desk in the ER, this little bitty podunk hospital in the middle of nowhere. And people would walk up, see my badge, and it would just roll right off the tongue. And I was like, how did you, how? Because there's so many Polish people there. We Polacks, you know, we stick together. It's just Skowiak. Um, or just Brie, you know, nobody can say the first name. Nobody can say the last name. Fun, fa fun fact here, um, when I was growing up, my maiden name was Mucklow. So it was Brianna Mucklow. And back then, nobody was named Brianna. So nobody could say the first name. Nobody could say the last name. And I was always mad at my mom, who was a hippie. And um, I used to tease her that when I went to college, I was going to meet John Smith and marry him. And my husband's first name is John. So she got quite a kick out of that before she died. You got your John, Brianna. Um, <clears throat> that's not that bad. Eh, eh, I mean, you know, it is what it is. It, the, the cool thing about it is there's nobody else. So when you are a provider at the hospital and you are constantly giving verbal orders and people are like, what's your name? Like J-U-S-K, there's nobody else that will come out when you put that name in. Of all 1,500 providers in this organization, there are none. <laughs> so that's that's a cool piece of it. Um, I hope you guys are having a good week. The weather here in Georgia has been absolutely stunning. Absolutely stunning. I have done quite a bit of hiking and so far the knee is holding out. Um, all right, let me get started a little bit here. Um, what did I do with my moisturizer? There it is behind the computer. <laughs> Very pleasant here. Yeah, you're in uh, Arizona, right? Somewhere like that, somewhere in the Midwest. I have some family out there and um, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't love it because it's so dry and brown and I really miss the green. Although, although the trade-off is I take Claritin every single day of my life. <laughs> so everything comes with a trade-off. My husband and I were just talking about this the other day. Like my youngest one, we've got about six years till she gets out of school. But after that, I think we're going to, we're going to downgrade. And so like looking at what our retirement home, where it would be, we're both mountain people. And I love the idea of moving to a full practice authority state so that I could open a clinic. Um, so I was looking at like, we like the Carolinas, like North Carolina, somewhere in the mountains, you know? Um, Asheville, if you've ever visited Asheville, North Carolina is a phenomenal town. It is definitely a contender. Um, Sedona. Yeah, I have, I have heard many, many people talk about this. My dad actually loves Sedona. We have an uncle out there and, um, he goes out there to visit a lot and loves Sedona. So I, I would like to go see that area. I have heard it's absolutely stunning. Um, I love the desert, although I live in San Francisco, um, yeah, I've been to San Francisco eons ago. I mean, so long ago that I was a teenager, so I'm not even sure how much of it I actually remember. Um, okay. All right. Let me get into a little bit of clinical stuff because I'm sorry you have to leave early, Scott, because this one probably is going to run long um, because it's just a lot of content um, and intubation. So the blog post I wrote on this comes from a place of, um, I don't know if you guys are aware of MCRIT or not, but if you're not following Scott Weingart, Josh Farkas, um, there's a couple other guys on there and I can't remember their names, but uh, Scott Weingart is an 
um, he calls himself, what does he call himself? An ED intensivist. So he works in an ER as an ICU doctor. So basically the holds like the immediate um, like resuscitation efforts and then continuing it for that like short, long range period, whatever. So it's sort of a crossover. So I really connect with his material because I'm of course ER ICU minded. But um, anyways, I followed him for a long, long time. Really, really obsessed with that guy and his content that he produces. He has um, a blog. That's where most of his stuff is at. It's on a blog. I think they do like a conference every year, like super involved and foam ed and all that kind of stuff. But because I think he's gotten so popular, his some of his blog stuff is not, you have to, it's a paid subscription. So I have been recommending this one particular podcast and blog series called The Laryngoscope as a Murder Weapon. It's like four or five podcast episodes that were pivotal to me when I was starting in the ICU because one of the biggest things I wanted to tackle and learn how to get good at when I started in the ICU was intubating and ventilators because I feel like as an intensivist, that's your job, right? You, you need to have a really good understanding of respiratory failure and shock, like real, real good. And ventilators intimidated me a lot. Um, we're not really taught about it in nursing school and intubation certainly scared me a lot. And I think the reason is when you intubate, like all eyes are on you, right? It's probably the only procedure you do where you're gonna have 20 people in a room who are literally staring at you and it is time limited and it is butt puckering and it is all on you. So <laughs> it's a little scary. You get into that dreaded um, KAIKO situation that can intubate, can oxygenate, where you have to perform an emergent cricothyroidotomy. That is, it, it, it's, it's an underlying elephant in the room every single time you go into intubate. And it should be scary. You, you should be scared. You should have a healthy level of fear going into this. Um, but the more you do it and the more you get good at assessing what a difficult airway looks like, developing a strategy for that difficult airway, um, the better you become at anticipating what the challenges will be and having like plan A, B, and C in place. It's very much like being a pilot, like going in the cockpit and having multiple different checkpoints. Like, is this here? Is this set up? Is this ready to go? Is this functional? Is this working? What is your goal or what is your job? What is your job? What is your job? And assigning roles and being very clear and verbal and systematic every time we go in the room that you, you're always checking these things. You're always assigning these tasks. You're always, you always have a plan A, B, and C. That helps mitigate some of that fear factor. Um, it definitely adds an element of control into your environment and helps you to kind of work through problems as they come because you don't really have time to think through it when you're in the moment of it. You just got to have it ready to go. Um, okay, let me pause for a second and look at some comments. Seriously, overwhelmingly beautiful Sedona is. Yeah, I'm, one day I'm going for sure. Um, let's intubate. Yes. Uh, sub sub specialties like ED intensives, ED ID. Um, you know, it is a very real possibility, particularly in these super, super big I, um, ERs. You know, Grady is one that's like that. Um, I worked at Grady as a nurse for a while and it is segmented. There's like an asthma clinic in the ER where it's nothing but a bunch of chairs and people who are in asthma and COPD exacerbation. And it's like breathing treatments and nibs, <laughs> like smoke filling the air in the back part of the hallway. Then you have like a, um, an urgent care side of it. Then you have a chest pain center where there's nothing but people who are in that phase before they go to like a cardiac OBS unit where they're being monitored in a specific way. Then there's like a medical side of the ER. There's a trauma side of the ER. There's a peds part of the ER. Like it's all very, very segmented out, which makes a lot of sense in big, big places like that. Um, Alex. Hey, Alex. Um, I believe he's on Apple podcast as well. I don't, you know, that's not where I get my podcast from. So I will have to check that out. I mean, I, he definitely has a podcast. I have plenty of his episodes saved. It's just that this one particular one I've had a lot of feedback from people when I suggest it that they can't find it. And when I go searching for it, it's part of a paid program. So it may just be certain like popular ones. I don't know. But um, if you can find it, particularly if you find it for free, it's a great series to download, take notes. I took notes and have them saved in my phone. Um, because what I'm going to get to when I'm going to finally wrap up the intro here and get to the point is that when you're looking at intubating someone, we spend a ton of time talking about and teaching people the technique of intubating. And it involves a lot of those checkpoints, a lot of those fallout plans. But I, I believe, I have become a firm believer in the fact that 
even more importantly to setting yourself up for success when you intubate than the checkpoints and the procedure and the technicality of it is mitigating the risk of what's wrong with the patient. Like what is the likely problem that is going to lead to cardiac arrest in this patient? And what can I do to minimize that risk before I even go in the room? And it depends on why you're intubating. So it's different for everybody. And if you can like investigate that, learn about that stuff, educate yourself about it and get a better knowledge of it, you will almost, almost completely eliminate that cardiac arrest factor. That's when things started getting better for me. I mean, not that I had like, <laughs> I'd say like I have a ton of people arresting when I was intubating, but like I would not see as much of the precipitous drop in the oxygen after I tubed, not see as much of the precipitous drop in the blood pressure when I intubated because I knew in advance what I was going to do to treat that. And I pre-treated or I chose different things. So we're going to talk about, I don't know, five or six different types of scenarios, the hypoxic patient, what you can do to mitigate that risk um, and a little bit of technique, uh, the metabolic acidosis patient, which I think is the scariest one of all, um, the hypotensive patient, the asthma patient, the GI bleed slash vomiting patient. So this is heavy content. So I'm sorry, Scott. Um, IVs, RNs, ventilators. Exactly. Yeah. Everybody do all the things. Um, I have been in, I would say I've been in NP for about seven years. I would say there's been four or five times in my career, maybe more than that, where I've been completely alone either at our sister hospital where there was only an ER doc in the hospital and no intensivist in-house um, and or no anesthesia in-house. And it was literally just me. Or I've been in situations where I've been in the hospital and my docs are all over the place and they can't stop and come help me. Um, typically speaking, I work in a very autonomous program. Um, I've been doing this for a long time. So there's a little bit of a trust factor there. But a lot of times if I call and say, hey, I'm getting ready to intubate this person, the normal status, the normal workflow for us is, okay, get everything set up. I'll show up. They show up for, you know, two minutes of putting the tube in and then they leave and do something else. But there are situations in which they can't be there for that. And it's literally just, I'll call them and say, I'm getting ready to tube. And they're like, all right, go for it. You have any concerns? You know, go for it. So you're kind of on your own, but not really on your own. But when I'm in that situation, I like to literally verbalize out loud so that people know what my plan is. Here's my risks. Here's what I want to do. I want you to push this drug. I want you to watch that monitor and let me know when the blood pressure drops below this amount. I want you to watch the sats. I want you to tell me when we get below this, you're going to hold the phone. And if I get into trouble, you're going to call my physician here or anesthesia here. And RT, I want you to have this bougie here. Like I am verbal about this is what I would like your role to be. And I find that people love, love, love that. When I was a brand new NP, I was a little bit nervous to be like delegating, like you must do what I tell you to do kind of thing. But actually people really love that kind of thing. Um, thank you. Um, okay, so let's just get right to it. So the hypoxic patient. So you're going to see a theme in this and all of the things that I suggest. So first I'm going to talk about like, what's the big risk? Like, why is it a concern? Um, what type of patients are at risk? And then what you can do about it. So what's the big deal with hypoxia? Well, I mean, this is kind of self-evident, right? But the longer you take to intubate someone, the more their sats are going to drop. And when sats drop, hypoxia is one of the H's in the H's and T's for cardiac arrest. So they will arrest if they get too hypoxic. Now, we this doesn't happen in my world too often uh, because we do things to mitigate it. But during COVID, we saw it a fair amount. Typically, what we would see is that they would just get profoundly more hypoxic um, during the peri-intubation and post-intubation thing. Um, it didn't always lead to codes, but sometimes it would. Um, so um, cardiac arrest is a big risk in this, and that's why it's a big deal. Um, and yes, of course, the longer it takes you to tube them, they're not getting FiO2 in there. It's going to get worse. The more attempts at intubating, the longer they're not getting the FI2. So all of these things comp compile to make it a big problem. Who's at risk? Um, okay, so this is interesting when I was doing research on this. Um, and it, I mean, it's totally self-evident. I don't know why it's one of those like obvious things. You're like, well, duh, naturally. But I, I never really thought about this. But do you know what the biggest um, risk factor or how do I word it? The biggest, okay, the highest predictor of peri-intubation hypoxia. Any thoughts? What would be the, the main thing that would make you concerned that a patient is going to drop their SATs 
during the peri-intubation phase. <laughs> I'm gonna give y'all a minute to ponder on that because <laughs> when I read it, I was like, oh God. W -O -W, worker breathing. Yeah, that would be one thing I would think of. Could you use an LMA or an LMA? Yes, uh, I used an LMA actually last week uh, when a patient was coding on the floor and the McGrath, which is the video laryngoscope, battery was dead. So I couldn't see. So I had to be down on a level where I could see the cords and they were on the ground. So I'm like this and I can't see any, I can't see anything. It's completely blind. So we ended up actually, I couldn't get it. And then um, one of my attendings who's a cardiac anesthesiologist couldn't get it. So we ended up putting LMA in and putting her back in the bed. Um, H and H. Good thought. Good thought. In title. Good thought. All good thoughts. Okay. You're going to laugh. Um, Pre-intubation hypoxia. <laughs> if you walk in the room and your patient is hypoxic, that is the biggest predictor. They're going to be hypoxic when you tube them. I know. I know. You come here for the solid gold quality content that I share with you guys. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so common things that will cause that ARDS, COVID-19, the worst offender of all pneumonia, pulmonary edema, atelectasis, ILD, PE, COPD. So, you know, all the things that cause hypoxic respiratory failure. <laughs> I overthought that too much, I know. Um, I'm really glad that y'all are feeling that too, because that is exactly what I thought when I was doing all the research. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, okay, what can you do about it? Here's the thing, what can we do about it? Um, okay. This is what's cool about this. What, you know, if you if you know you have a patient with pneumonia, they've got a bad diffuse pneumonia, and they've been struggling for days and days on BiPAP, and they're just not maintaining their SATs. I'm describing a COVID patient because that's so much of what we've done for the past three years. But that's how they look, and they are fatigued. So their worker breathing is high. They're tachypneic, and they're hypoxic. Like this is this is going to be rough. This is going to be rough. Just go ahead and anticipate it's going to be bad. Um, and what you should do is pre-oxygenate. That's the first and foremost thing. And here's what I like to do. Even if they're on BiPAP, take the BiPAP off for a second, put a nasal cannula in, pump it all the way up to 15 liters. Or if you got a high flow, as high as you can go. Um, because there is something called apneic oxygenation, where if a patient is not actively breathing, they will still get some passive flow from that FiO2 that's in the nose. So I always put uh, a nasal cannula in everybody's nose, but in particular, the patient who's hypoxic, bump it all the way up as high as possible. Yes and no. I'll get to that in just a second. Um, then if they were on BiPAP, put them back on BiPAP, crank them up to 100%, crank up the pressure support like the IPAP or the EPAP portion of it, which is your oxygenation phase, pump that up higher. Um, a lot of times people can't tolerate that because high amounts of pressure support on CPAP is very, very uncomfortable. But these people are already fatiguing, minimally responsive, or you've already given drugs. So just bump it up. They'll be fine. Um, so pre-oxygenate with more than one thing. Nasal cannula plus something else. Non-rebreather plus CPAP. Um, uh, bag valve mass we'll talk about in a minute. Um, typically, I don't use the BVM until after I've given them um, the paralytic. Because unless you are a really good bagger, it is hard to synchronize with that patient. It's, it's hard. I don't care who you are and how many times you've done it. It's hard to synchronize to give them the exact amount of volume they need and the exact rate that they need to match with what they're doing. Plus, it's going to be changing because you're giving them meds, right? So I like to leave them on whatever they were on before. Let them breathe as much on their own while you get everything set up. And then after they stop breathing because you paralyzed them, then bag or just go straight for it. So I don't bag as much as most people. Um, now, obviously, if they desat in between attempts, uh, you got a bag. And here's the thing. Here's the other thing you can do, and probably should be, aside from pre-oxygenating, um, one of the most important things that you set up in regards to getting ready to tube these people is really, really aiming for first pass success. These are not the people that you want to mess around with. These are not the people that you want the inexperienced um, intubator messing with. This is not the one that you want to have to pull out and then bag because they're going to drop and they're going to drop like a rock, particularly after you take away all of that 
sympathetic overdrive that they have that is helping them to breathe heavy and fast and get that FiO2 in. You took that away when you give them a sedative and you give them a paralytic. So now it's on you. So you got to get a good jaw thrust. You got to get a good airway opening. You got to bag really well. And even with that, it's hard. It's way harder than their inherent breathing. Just like when someone is in cardiac arrest, we do CPR for them. And is it effective? Ish. Yeah. But it's nowhere near what they need inherently. Um. Compared to RSI and the ED, this sounds so relaxed. Gathering equipment, delegating roles, pre -oxygen. Yeah, in general, the ICU is a much calmer, well, for the most part, a calmer environment than the ER. It's less rushed. It's less hurried. Um, it is. It is. It's much more civilized. <laughs> Not always, but in comparison to the ER, it is. Um, you also have a little bit of time to think through it because this is somebody you've probably been rounding on for a couple of days. You knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. Glidoscopes. We're going to get to glidoscopes in a little bit too. Um, I, I like it wild. I like it wild. I, again, I am, my foundation is ER. So I like a little bit of the wild, wild west too. Um, so you're pre-oxygenating you, from two different sources. You want to shoot for getting your SpO2 over 95%. And you want it there for three minutes at least. So three minutes to really, really um, hyper oxygenate them. And if you're doing this in between attempts, you, same thing. Get a good jaw thrust, get a good airway opening and bag and get those sats up as high as humanly possible, but at least 95, 93, 95 and leave it there for three straight minutes. That's enough cardiac cycles to help get that oxygen down in there so that then the next time you have apneic oxygenation where you take away the bag, where you're not breathing for them, you have a longer time frame before they start to desat again. And some of the stuff that Scott talks about, I believe it's been a lot of years since I read this, is there is some data that shows that you have up to eight minutes of apneic oxygenation. Um, now, what that looks like for different people means different things. Like, did you adequately get that three minutes of all those cardiac cycles to truly get them pre-oxygenated? And will it last a full eight minutes? I don't know. But I'll tell you, it doesn't feel like eight minutes when you're down there in the airway and you cannot see anything and you're freaking out and you're trying all these different maneuvers to get in there and you can't. It may only be a minute. It, it feels like eight minutes. <laughs> um, and they may drop a lot. I find they drop a lot quicker than eight minutes, but that's what the research has said. Um, so you're aiming for one pass success, most skilled person intubates, once you intubate and then they drop, which is what happens most of the time, um, what you want to do, there's a mnemonic called DOPES, um, and it stands for, it stands for, what is the D? I don't remember what the D is for. Okay. You're looking to see, is the tube in the right place? Basically, is it positioned right? Do you have bilateral breath sounds? Do you hear a pneumo? Um, is there an obstruction in the tube? Can you pass the suction catheter? Is there a kink in the tubing? Is the tube itself kinked over? Um, all of these things to determine is the positioning right first and foremost, because that is usually the first thing that leads to it. And then beyond that, it's going to be what, you know, what else is causing them to drop? Is their blood pressure dropping? Because when your blood pressure drops, your oxygen level will drop. Um, uh, so working through what could be wrong there. And then it, a piece of it is just being patient because I actually just recently watched a video from a, um, he's a physician who is a director for an EMS team. And it was a great, great video. I'll see if I can find it and link it down here. Um, it's like 30 minutes long, but he talks about research in regards to the pulse ox lag. And he said, oh gosh, I don't remember how, he didn't say how long. But the bottom line is that you are going. there's going to be a lag between what's actually happening in the body and what you're seeing on the pulse oximeter. So while they may drop, inherently, they may not truly be that low. Plus, is where is the pulse ox at? Is it on the same like extremity where your cuff is? Because one of the things I do before I intubate is change that time frame for um, automatic recycling of the blood pressure to like one minute. So is it constantly going off and you're just not getting flow? Like, is that a factor? So make sure your stats are actually legit. Um, and then dial up that peat valve. So on the, the little red side port coming off of your BVM or on your vent, dial that peat up. Um, 
consider proning. Do they have physiology that, or a pathophysiology that would um, lend itself to benefit with proning? I find that diffuse lung problems like COVID, like bilateral diffuse pneumonias, like ARDS, uh, they respond very well to proning. So consider whether or not you just want to immediately flip that patient, which is what we did when COVID. Um, find the optimum vent mode. Perhaps this patient is going to be, are they asynchronous? Or are they just under sedated? Do you need to give them more meds? Do you need to find a different mode? Um, APRV is good for a lot of people with hypoxia, not everybody, but for some people. So maybe you need to consider an advanced mode of ventilation strategy after you bag them up like APRV. Um, and do you need to bronch them? Is there something in the airways? Like when you tube them, did you see a bunch of stuff in the airway? Um, were they super, super dry, dry people who've been on BiPAP for days and days have like a lot of like thick dried, um, secretions that get stuck down in there. And then they develop atelectasis and atelectasis will make you hypoxic. So maybe you need to bronch them. Um, and I think that's all I have for hypoxia. Dislodged. Yes. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> Again, you come here for the quality education and content, don't you? And it's actually probably the makeup really more than anything. Let's just be real. <laughs> How y'all like my neon pink shirt, guys? Um, I think this is my signature color for the spring. I actually just bought some neon pink shoes as well. <laughs> They're super obnoxious. My husband's like, uh, well, you can see that a mile away. I'm like, yeah. I kind of dig it. I all, it started with my, I don't know if I've showed y'all or not, my neon pink phone case. <laughs> I got that because I found at night, I would set my phone down in places and it's black and you can't ever find it. I mean, you can always call it, but like if you're just looking around, it's easy to spot neon pink. It's obnoxious. Those of us who struggle with um, organization and call of things that have ADD, we like things that are obvious like that. Love the neon. You glow in the scarf. <laughs> nice job. Exactly. It's all dark in there. They can, they can find me, which maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. Hot pink eyeshadow. Oh my gosh. I don't know. I don't know if I'm so bold. I mean, that's, that's going pretty far. <laughs> um, okay. Airway pressure release ventilation. APRV. Yep, yep, yep. Love some APRV for the right patient. Our trauma team loves APRV and they want us to put everybody on APRV, but APRV isn't for everybody, but for some it is. I, Scott, I don't know if I have neon pink, hot pink. Like I have a lot of super neutral eye stuff. Um, APRV versus CMV. Oh, CMV? Are you talking about like controlled mandatory ventilation, like CMV? I haven't used that in probably 15 years. <laughs> um, are you talking about like an assist control type of volume ventilation? CMV? Yeah, I haven't used CMV in 15 years. So CMV is um, the, okay, with a ventilator, this is my vent talk um, in two seconds. The ventilator is a machine that we dial numbers to deliver breath to a patient. You can control one of two things. You can control the volume of breath they're delivered or the pressure that is breath uh, of the breath that is delivered. You cannot control both. That is you controlling the independent variable. That's the piece that I control as the ventilator dialer. The patient then has a equal and inverse reactive um, response to that breath. So if you dial in volume, they get to control the pressure. If you dial in pressure, they get to control the volume. So it's a yin and yang. So that's the, the overview basics of how ventilators work, kind of. Um, these modes allow a patient to breathe somewhat on their own, either during the breath that's assisted, like an assist control, or SIMB, which is where the ventilator will deliver a set volume of breath. And then in between those breaths, the patient can breathe on their own. CMV takes away all work of breathing for patients ever. So this patient has to not be breathing, not making any spontaneous efforts at all to breathe. And if they do, the machine will not allow them to breathe. So it is a very, uh, it induces a lot of asynchrony in somebody who is breathing spontaneously. 
And we've shifted in the past decade or so, or so away from this, we need to let the machine breathe completely for them. It really should be a balance so that the patient can be more awake, more interactive, and more quickly wean from the vent. So CMV is not something I personally have had much experience with because it was only very early on in my career that I saw it used. Um, somebody who's paralyzed, yeah, you could do CMV. But honestly, if they're paralyzed and they're not taking any spontaneous breaths, then that's essentially CMV, whether it's an AC mode that I set or not, they're just not breathing with it, you know? Um, okay, so SIMV, I know, SIMV is cytomegalovirus, <laughs> different, different, different thing. Um, okay, so metabolic acidosis, and this is the patient that to me, like I said, is the scariest one of all of them. This is the one that always makes me nervous. Um, every single time. And there's a little bit of um, disease state we have to talk about in regards to why. Um, so, all right, here's my question to y'all. Um, Cause the body is inherently smart. I love the human body. I love, I think that God has designed our bodies just so perfectly and it's fascinating to me. There is an equal and reactive um, response to just about all disease states um, because our bodies are designed to keep going. They want to live. Um, so there's all of these checkpoints in place, all of these reactive um, things that occur when our body is in a, a state of badness. So a patient who has acidosis, say it's metabolic acidosis, because that's specifically what we're talking about. What is the body's way of trying to keep itself going? What is the compensatory response for metabolic acidosis? Pulling out all the brushes and all the land because that is a secret to making things tidy bicarb production tachypnea tachypnea that's the answer respiratory acidosis or respiratory alkalosis pardon me so metabolic acidosis the body's going to go into a state or try to go into a state of respiratory alkalosis to compensate for it. So they're going to hyperventilate. That's right. They're going to, they're going to coo small. They're going to breathe heavy and deep and fast. They're going to do a lot of breathing. So when you walk in the room, what is that patient going to look like? They're going to look like the type of patient that your nurse has probably been calling you about. This patient is really struggling to breathe. They're breathing a lot. I'm worried about their breathing. Can I sedate them? Can I, can I do something to slow this breathing down? Because they look uncomfortable. You know, they're breathing like a freight train. But here's the thing. Uh, the unknowing or, or less astute clinician will say, oh, yeah, they do look bad. Let me give them some Presidex. Let me give them some Ativan. Let me try and slow that down. Well, you're setting them up for a code because you're taking away all of that compensation. And then, hey, Ronil, 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 Ronil? I don't know. You'll have to help me out there. I don't know if I'm saying it right or not, but I'm so glad that you joined us. Pre-RT, love your channel. Oh, do you follow Joe? I love Joe. Joe, the respiratory coach. Need to follow him for sure. Um, welcome. We're talking about intubation. So the metabolic acidosis patient um, that the nurse wants you to sedate away uh, all of that compensation and you do it and then they go and you're like, well, crap, that didn't work out. Um, same thing happens when you tube this patient, right? Because they're doing all this hyperdrive breathing and you give them medicine to sedate them to RSI or DSI, delayed sequence intubate them. And guess what? They're no longer breathing like that anymore. So now the CO2 starts to rise and now you're going to compound a metabolic acidosis with a respiratory acidosis. And guess what acidosis causes? Cardiac arrest. So these are the ones that these patients and pulmonary hypertension, these are the ones that you, you intubate them and they code most of the time. And you're like, I don't know where this came from. You know, they weren't like dropping their blood pressure. They weren't dropping their sets. They just coded. These are the ones. Um, so you don't really see it coming. And unless you know to look for it and mitigate this risk, it's going to happen. So metabolic acidosis patients should scare you more than anybody else because it is failure to recognize on most people's part. Is it because you didn't continue? Exactly. Exactly. If you take away someone's overdrive to breathe, then the CO2 accumulates. 
So we're going to get to the things you can do for it, which is going to be to breathe more for them or breathe more effectively for them so that you're at least keeping up with the level of compensation that they were doing before you took away their drive. Um, so who, what type of patients are at risk? Um, common etiologies. And this is why it is a big, big problem for us is sepsis. How many people in the ICU have sepsis? Like all of them, like sepsis sets you over this. DKA, lactic acidosis, um, renal failure, <laughs> uh, overdoses, meth, methamphetamines will do it to you independently of anything else. Uh, but they also have a rhabdo with it, which makes it worse. Um, alcohol, acute alcohol intoxication will do it. So men, most all of our ICU patients have some degree of metabolic acidosis. And it's usually because they have multiple pieces of this. They got high on their meth, which drove it up. They were probably drinking too, because why not? And then they, they were down for a little while and developed a rhabdo. Now they have a little bit of an aspiration that's turning into an ammonia and they're septic and they've got lactic and the kidneys aren't working because of all that rhabdo. So it's like all these things combined. How many, all of our patients, right? So it's a very common thing. It's failure to recognize, failure to treat properly and failure to plan for that leads to these problems. So those are the people who are at risk. What can you do about it? Avoid over sedating. So even before you get to the point where you're going to tube this patient, this is the one that when the nurse calls and says, I want to give them something because they're having trouble breathing, make sure they don't have a metabolic acidosis first before you treat. And if they do, limit it. Do a lot of education to everybody around you. Hey, 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 this is normal. This is good. This is why. Let's trend our ABGs. Let's make sure this is getting better. Let's put them on a BiPAP and help them out a little bit more. You know, if they're not failing, to, you know, there's a whole series of things on how bad is the metabolic acidosis and have they compensated fully or not fully? And are there other pieces that are impeding their ability to breathe like a new onset encephalopathy, like a stroke, like over sedation, something else that is impairing the, the neurological respiratory center drive to breathe. That's a bad combination. That plus renal failure, all bad, bad, bad. Um, bicarb, we're going to get to bicarb. We're going to get to that. Hold tight. Um, Actually, that's my next bullet point. So <laughs> good timing. Good timing there, Alex. You knew. You're clairvoyant. Um, here's my thoughts on bicarb. Unless you have a bicarb wasting syndrome, like renal failure, like you look at your CMP, your fish bones, and your CO2, which is actually bicarb, on your CMP, unless that is low, um, you, you, it's, your acidosis is probably not a factor of bicarb wasting. It's a factor of too much acid. And so you give some bicarb and bicarb in the body breaks down into CO2 and water. So if you don't have the ability to ventilate, say your metabolic acidosis patient is trying to compensate and they're, they're not, they're acidotic. The pH is like seven, two, um, or something is impeding their ability to breathe well, now you've just given them more acid to blow off. So unless your patient is ventilating well and they have a um, bicarb wasting syndrome, I do not give bicarb before I intubate. I might do it later, but I wouldn't do it before I intubate until I can control how much air I can blow off, how much CO2 I can blow off. Um, um, exactly. It is a band-aid. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, for some people for your renal failure patients, these are the, these are the ones that typically will respond well to a bicarb infusion, um, pushes a bicarb. I'm not a super fan of, unless you get into code type situations, but, um, they get a big sodium bolus from it. There's just a lot of things why I don't love a bolus of it. But an infusion in someone that is severely acidotic and it's going to take time to, like they're on CRT, it's going to take it a long time to kind of clear that. Yes. Or it's going to take you a while or you're, and you're not yet at that point where they need dialysis. Yes. Um, Given bicarb infusion. But it's slow. The kidney response to acidosis is days, right? The respiratory response to acidosis is ours. So kidney bicarb is a buffering band-aid. It's going to give you exactly like Scott said, it's going to give you minutes. Maybe it's not going to give you full term um, buffering compensation. So it, it's, to me, it's a bridge to when we can get to the patient to dialysis. That's what it is for me. Um, yes. The bicarb. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, sure is. Um, <laughs> I love that. Clairvoyant. That's a good drag name. Um, love to see how the makeup would look for her. Probably hot pink, right? <laughs> um, okay. So what's next? Um, okay. The end title CO2. Somebody brought that up earlier. This is the patient I would put the end title on before I tube them. Because what I want to see is and it's a t so an end title is going to give you um, it's a snapshot in time. But the nice thing is it's a continuously changing snapshot in time. So what I like to do is look at the trends, look at the overall trends. So before you take away their respiratory drive, what is the trend of their end title? And if this is a patient who wasn't like supremely acidotic and they're doing a decent enough job compensating, but they're getting tired, they've been kusmalling for a little while, it's not getting better, it's just time to tube them. This is the patient that I would just try and match what they were doing on their own. And the end title gives you objective information to try and match. Once you tube them and get them on the vent, change the dials on your ventilator to get you to a point where your end title that's continuously monitored on the vent matches what they were doing beforehand. Um, it also gives you a very, it's a very sensitive indicator for um, early signs of, I hear my dog barking outside, early signs of um, decompensation. So if you're intubating and the end title, you know, before you intubated was, you know, moderate, they within a moderate range, like 35, 40, something like that. And then you're tubing and you know that you like you've given them meds, you've taken away their respiratory drive and you notice that the end title is starting to drop 30, 25, 20, 15. Oh crap. Oh crap. This should trigger you back, 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 back. We need to bag some more, you know, cause they are not blowing off their CO2. So now they're developing a respiratory acidosis on top of their exactly impending respiratory failure. They are, they're going to code. So as you watch that end title kind of drop, it should be your trigger to bag more, do more to breathe for them, get that tube in there faster. It's just sort of a, it's a monitoring tool. This is one that I would let the RT or somebody, I would say before we started, hey, will you watch that? Let me know once we start to dip at this point. Um, yeah, um, it's also a great tool in cardiac arrest. I love end titles in cardiac arrest. The problem is just that it takes so darn long to find one, get it on, get it set up, get it run, but I do love them in cardiac arrest. Um, it's a very, very sensitive indicator. You will see changes in your CO2 long before you see changes in your O2. Like you'll start to see the end title drop, 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 and then they're not ventilating well, and then they'll start to drop their if their PO2 after that. Um, okay, we talked about that. We talked about that. Um, once you've given RSI, you want to bag like steady, um, good deep volumes, and like at least a rate of twelve. Um, I would pro I tend to overbag Weingart's recommendations were 12. I tend to overbag more than that because as long as their compliance is good and you're not got a risk of barotrauma or volume trauma, just bag them up because you can blow it down even better than they were before, which is going to help you compensate more. Um, why would I say end title is a more sensitive indicator of respiratory failure than COP? Because it will, you will see a change in the way someone is ventilating long before you will see an oxygenation change. Remember when we talked in the beginning about that um, eight minute apneic oxygenation thing? So you got eight minutes where you're not ventilating, you're not breathing before you'll see the PO2, SPO2 or the PO2 on your gas start to drop. Eight minutes. So it is a um, sooner, <laughs> earlier, earlier, that's the word. <laughs> it's an earlier sign that they're not ventilating than the, the PO2 dropping. Um, it's just physiology really. Um, once you have them to, okay, aim for first pass success. This is the thing you're going to see on everyone. All of these patients are not the ones you want the novice intubating. They're not. Um, mm. the problem with this in this particular patient is that you have unpredictable mm, levels of bagging in between attempts. Um, a code I was at recently was in an area where codes almost never happen. And it had been a long, long time since the staff in that area had been a part of a code. And the person who was helping me 
was so upset and, you know, shocked, I guess she could not, she could not bag. She just could not bag. And I had to do the whole like, nope, nope, you get out of the way. Somebody else come back. Um, so if, but that's because I was directly looking at what she was doing. If I'm looking down an airway, I'm not paying attention to what's happening over here. If I'm in and out, in and out, I'm not paying as much attention to who's doing the bagging. And if you're not bagging effectively enough, these are the ones that get worse in code. So bagging is bad in these people. Um, once they're intubated, set the vent to a high respiratory rate um, and tidal volume is tolerated to shoot for a minute ventilation on the higher end. Um, I also recommend higher than I think um, Weingart does and probably even some of the literature does. Because again, even if this person was doing a decent enough job beforehand, it wasn't truly decent enough or I wouldn't be trying to tube them. So even if the pH didn't reflect it, they were tiring out. So I want to do everything I can to help them compensate until I can correct the metabolic acidosis. So I'm going to probably put them, I'm going to shoot for like that 10, 12, maybe even 13, 14 range on the minute ventilation. And you can either achieve that through higher respiratory rate or tidal volume or both, depending on what their lung physiology will allow for. Um, yeah. So that's the metabolic acidosis patient. Scariest one of all. I'm sorry, this is going so long, y'all. 46 minutes and we're only two patients in. Oh, I apologize. Um, let me get on with this part of things. I have a brand new NP student with me this week, and she's great. I've really been enjoying her. She, y'all, last night was her first night, and... Um, Great. She's been a nurse for a long time and she's actually been an FNP for a couple of years. So she's, this is not her first rodeo, but like we had a sick patient, we had some lines to do. And I was like, do you want to do the lines? She's like, sure. I gave her this whole speech about, all right, we're going to start with the radio art line. It's the hardest procedure that we can do in this job. So you're not probably going to get it. Here's some tips. It's okay. If we don't get it here, here's our, here's our plan A, B, and C. <laughs> Dude, she like, I didn't even get sterile. I'm just standing there telling her what to do. And she's like, boop, right in. I was like, <laughs> you jerk. <laughs> I hate it when students show me up. <laughs> you're supposed to, you're supposed to be there to make me feel better. Okay. <laughs> I was so excited for her though. It was, it's always such a rewarding moment when students get like procedures in because it's very, I don't know. It's just very like immediate and tactile. And I don't know, there's just something a lot more rewarding about it, particularly when you're novice versus like writing a great note. Like, okay, that's great. Now what, you know, um, gotta go see the eye doctor. Okay. Bye. Um, will you have him check my eyes while you're there? Because clearly I need to do that. Get that done too. But being the um, <laughs> non-compliant patient, I'm not going to do it. Because um, why would I? Nursing. I love NP students. I used to be one. Same. Same. Um, okay. So the hypotensive patient. The hypotensive patient. This is also a scary one. Um, what's the big deal with them? Well, the drugs that twofold. The drugs that we give them in the RSI are going to take away that sympathetic tone. So they're no longer going to have that beta adrenergic activity, that natural catecholamine response that the body is telling them to provide in order to keep the heart rate going and keep the blood pressure going. You've just taken it away. Then the other thing is when you tube someone, you take them from a place of negative pressure ventilation to positive pressure ventilation. And what that does is it increases the intrathoracic um, pressures. And when you increase the chest pressures, you're pushing down on the vessels in the chest, in the thoracic space. So all those greater vessels that are returning blood to the heart suddenly have less room to pump blood. So your preload decreases. And when your preload decreases, you're getting less blood flow to the heart and suddenly you bottom out. Um, and yeah, so those two things will compound pretty badly. Increasing, increased intrathoracic pressure in PZV. Exactly. See, you know, before I even said it, increasing work. Exactly. Um, who's at risk? Anyone with low blood pressure. <laughs> Captain Obvious here. Uh, what can you do about it? Okay. What I do about it is this. Um, hang IV fluids before you even get started, like have them going, make sure you have two very, very good functioning IVs. I actually have the nurses push, like show me that they're pushing fluids through them beforehand because I've been burned. 
before that have been in a situation where we thought we had a one line that was good and we did not. And it was, you know, trying to get an IO that's not readily, anyways, just make sure you got good access in the story. <laughs> um, hang some fluids through them and get them just running. So you have, um, I mean, you're getting good volume to them, but it also helps with delivery of drugs that you need to give very quickly. Use less tidal volume and increase rate. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Um, you can do that. So the benefit of having lower tidal volumes is that you reduce, you reduce that risk of atelectatic um, damage to the alveoli, that shearing pressure of the opening and closing of the alveoli, which can lead to ARDS. So that's how the onset of the low tidal volume ventilation guidelines all came about. Um, uh, yeah, so that, you know, and also if you have a patient who's got really bad compliance, like COVID, like ILD, like fibrosis, where they're, they're hard to bag, they're stiff. Um, it takes a lot of pressure to get air in and they're at very high risk of barotrauma and pneumos. Um, you're not going to be able to get a lot of volume in because of that much pressure. So I would go up on the rate instead. But if that patient wasn't naturally inherently wanting to breathe fast, it makes them very uncomfortable. So then you have to heavily sedate and or paralyze them. Um, but yes, one of those two, depending on the pathology and how they respond to it, one of those two and or both, both will get your minute ventilation up because minute ventilation is respiratory rate times tidal volume. Um, um, okay, so hypotension, levofed. I would also get levofed hanging and going and have some push dose pressors on hand. Now at my institution, we have neosinephrine. It's, you can keep it in the refrigerator. Um, they're already pre-mixed. It's a 10 ml stick. We call it a stick and you can push um, a CC at a time. I think one CC is a hundred mics of Neo. I believe that's right. Um, I don't love this. I'll be honest. I don't love Neo. I mean, obviously it's what we use in a pinch. What I prefer to do um, for most everybody but specifically if I have a cardiac pathology is to make push dose epi, which I have talked about in other blog posts, blog, blog cast, blog post. I haven't talked about it on here. I don't think I've done a live on it, but I have talked about it before. And the reason I like epi is that epi gives you beta and alpha activity. So you're going to get um, increase in chronotropy, dromotropy, inotropy, all the heart pump effects. And you're also going to get some afterload um, increase. You're going to get some squeezing down on the pipe, some increase in your SVR. You get both. Now, NEO only gives you afterload increase. It's not going to do anything to increase your heart rate, your blood pressure, uh, your cardiac output. It's not going to increase contractility um, or cardiac output. It doesn't affect that at all. All it does is squeeze down on the pipes. And the problem is if you have someone who has pulmonary hypertension, who's already got squeezed down pipes, if you have someone who um, already has issues with flow or obstruction somewhere, if you have someone who has a PE where there's something stuck in a blood vessel and now you're squeezing them even harder, if you have, um, I don't know, this is escaping me right now, but scenarios in which squeezing the pipes is going to make the heart work even harder, you're going to make them worse rather than better with that. So I like a more balanced presser and epi in this case is just one that we can mix like that. Levo, I don't know that Levo can mix like that. So I would hang a bag of Levo. I would make push dose epi and I would tell the nurse to push a CC at a time of the epi, just a CC at a time. It can't be cardiac arrest dose epi. It cannot. You'll, you'll kill them. <laughs> can't do that. Um, Anyways, so have a plan in place for temporarily treating the blood pressure because it's going to be a, most likely it's going to be a temporary problem. Um, then choose induction agents that have less of the negative inotropy effect. So Atomidate, Propofol, Versed, Fentanyl, all will drop your blood pressure pretty precipitously. So will Presidex but ketamine will not. Ketamine actually will make them hyperdynamic. So I tend to default to ketamine. Um, I will give them a big slug of ketamine, like a, a milligram to a milligram and a half per kig as a push, um, plus or minus some Versed. Um, and then I will give them sucks or rock. Um, and I find that that mitigates a lot of that problem. So ketamine, real simple solution, just use ketamine. 
there are situations in which you can't use ketamine. I find it's actually less in real life than people talk about. So I tend to default to ketamine if the patient is hypotensive. Mm. And then once they're intubated, you want to keep the airway pressures, including the PEEP, as minimal as possible to get them to the oxygenation status that they need, because the more intrathoracic pressure they have, the less venous return they have, which is good for someone with heart failure. Um, Vec, I never use Vecuronium. The only time I used Vecuronium was during COVID when we had a shortage of Nimbex and we had to use Vecuronium as the infusion of choice. And I don't exactly know why that is. Um, I don't really have a good answer for you on why that is. Where I work, um, the drugs of choice that we use are succinylcholine and rocuronium. And of those, I prefer rock. Um, Sux is shorter acting. Um, so when I first started, I would use succinylcholine because I felt like, well, if I can't get the tube in, then I have less time that I have to worry about breathing for this person. But I find in reality, that's never actually been a problem, almost never been a problem. Um, and rock uranium is a cleaner drug. You have less side effects. There's less, um, there's no problem with hyperkalemia being a factor, which it is with sucks. Um, you get less of that, um, uh, like, um, neuromuscular depolarization twitching that you'll get with sucks. Um, I just like it. I just like it a little better. Um, I have to think a little bit less about it. I don't worry so much, you know, with sucks, I always got to stop and think through like what's wrong with the patient, how are the kidneys looking, all of these kind of factors. So I default to rock. Um, all right, I need to probably do a little bit of this here. Um, okay, we decided neon pink, but I don't have neon pink, Scott. So he's not here to watch it, so it won't be quite as <laughs> sad for him. Um, I do have like a pink pink though. I could do that. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, I think I'll do that. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, I think that was all I had on blood pressure. Yep. That's all I have on blood pressure patient. The next one is the asthma patient, which is also super, super scary. You know, I'm just realizing one population of people I didn't put on here were pulmonary hypertension patients. They are also people you don't really want to tube if you don't have to. Problem is just that I don't really know what you can do for those people. I don't know that there's much you can do for them. It's just going to suck. Um, okay. So asthma, the reason asthma is bad is that kind of like when we were talking about the metabolic acidosis patient, they, those people are doing absolutely everything they can to compensate. And when you take that away, it gets really, really bad. Um, they have a bad acidosis, respiratory acidosis, typically speaking, because they're so constricted. Um, Sorry, getting alerts from my daughter. Um, I feel like they always come in when I'm on here, every time. She knows, she has a sixth sense, she knows. I can't actually call her back right now. Um, so, and the airway pressures is a big, big problem, right? Anybody who's air trapping, but I find clinically that asthma is way, way worse than COPD. But anybody who's already retaining a bunch of volume of air in their chest, who then gets bagged, and ventilated, the pressures are going to go way, way high. And that is going to decrease venous return, and then they're going to code. Um, these people are scary to intubate. They also are very, very dependent on that, like, catecholamine surge thing. So they tend to have hemodynamic collapse, too. Um, these are people that typically I have epi going because epinephrine, even if their blood pressure, and actually typically their blood pressure isn't low, but, um, and so you have to titrate the epi based on not letting the blood pressure go super duper high, but epi is a bronco is a potent bronchodilator. It's beta two and beta one effect. So this would be somebody I would probably hang epi as I am getting ready to tube them. And I would use ketamine to induce them because ketamine is also a bronchodilator and that is their problem. They have a lot of bronco bronchospasm actually. Um, and they also have the respiratory acidosis. So that's why, who's at risk? Status asthmaticus. Typically a young person too. Um, what can you do about it? First pass success. I know you're shocked. <laughs> um, 
Minimize how much you're bagging. These are the patients you really, 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 if you can't directly watch the person who's bagging, you want to watch the person who's bagging because if they bag, you know, too fast or too much, like they're using two hands to bag, don't use one hand to bag and breathe slow, very slow, once every seven seconds or so, slower than I probably would even normally because the pressures are so, so high already. Um, it, yes. Yes, exactly. To avoid bear trauma and to to reduce the amount of intrathoracic pressure, which is limiting your venous return. Um, okay, we talked about that. Vent strategy. Now, more than anything, it's really the ventilator strategy that is so key on these people because it is so easy to mess them up. It's super complicated. There's a lot that's involved with it. And basically what it boils down to is the fact that because these people have a respiratory acidosis and high intrathoracic pressures, these two are completely different strategies and the way you would approach them are exact opposites. So which one do you target? And that's the challenging piece of this. Most people, I find in reality, most RTs get stressed out by respiratory acidosis. And so they want to overbreathe. When this patient has a pH of 7.2, 7.25, 7.3, they want to do something to increase the respiratory rate, increase the tidal volume. And what that is going to do is increase the pressures. And then you are going to see your tidal volumes decrease. And then you are going to see the end tidal go up. And then... <laughs> Actually, instead of going da down, which it should, if you're increasing that, it's actually going to go up. Um, your pressures are going to go up and they're going to code. Um, so it, you have to really, really, really watch the ventilator on these people. Um, this is not the ventilator. I don't want to, I want to, I want to say this um, as respectfully as I possibly can. This is not the ventilator that you just want to sleep on, that you want to let the RT control and make changes to. This is the one that I would put an order in that said, you know, no ventilator changes without discussion with the primary team. And it's just because it happens so quickly. It happens so quickly and it happens all the time. I walk by rooms and I'll see it. And I'm like, what happened here? What is the change? This is bad. Anyways, it's a whole long drawn out discussion that I cannot do on top of this video. So it'll have to be its own thing. Um, and I do have a blog post on that if you're interested in it. But as my patients, they're rare, but when you do get them, they're scary. Um, so if you get it, like, you know, just save that blog post somewhere that you can find it. <laughs> it walks you through everything. Um, okay. Another scary one is the GI bleed or the vomiting patient. Both, both are scary. Um, this one is kind of the most fun, honestly, because this is the one that like, you've got, you've probably got a plan in place um, and you can fix the problem quickly. You can get them extubated quickly. So it's not like super depressing generally. Um, there's like a known strategy here and there are things you can do. There are actually things you can do um, before you intubate them that makes a huge difference on whether or not the patient vomits when you intubate them. I've seen it happen a million times and I didn't know this early on. And once I started doing this stuff, I was like, Oh my God, this actually works. It's pretty cool. Um, but the, okay. So the, what's the problem? The big problem with these people is exactly that vomit. I mean, need I say more, the worst thing in the world to someone who's trying to see cords is the airway suddenly being occluded, obstructed, like no view being completely taken away because of vomit. And it like just keeps coming and coming and coming and you can't see, you are like, Oh my God. And you're going to push it down into the lungs and it's going to cause a pneumonitis and possibly a pneumonia later on down the road. Like, it's just bad. Um, the very first patient I ever intubated, um, I don't know if I should tell that story or not, but I, I've intubated before in a situation where somebody who vomited and it freaks you out. Um, so what can you do? Um, oh, who's at risk? People with GI bleed or vomiting. Um, or got a big belly. Um, because when you bag, a lot of that air, even when you're bagging really, really well with a good open airway, a lot of that goes into the belly and makes the belly bigger and then makes them vomit. So what can you do about it? This is very systematic. So I always have the nurse place an NG tube first and decompress the stomach, suck everything out. Just turn it on high, psh, pull it all out. Empty it out as much as possible. 
Then you're going to give a push right before you intubate of 10 milligrams of Reglam. And nurses always say, well, they're already getting like Q6 hour Reglam or they're getting PR and Reglam. This is not necessarily um, for gastric motility. Okay. It's not, that's not going to help you in the short run, but what it is going to do is raise the lower esophageal sphincter pressure. So, and that happens within minutes. I want to say, okay, 10 minutes, 10 minutes. So you've got to plan a little bit in advance, but 10 minutes, it's going to raise the lower esophageal sphincter pressure so that if they do gag, it's less likely to come up. So very, very, very effective. I've seen it happen actually. So I always give a push of that right beforehand. Um, if possible, intubate with the patient as upright as possible. This is hard for me. This is hard for me. Um, but if you can, um, don't lay them all the way back. Try and set them up as much as possible because then if they do vomit, gravity is on your side. Um, so, that's not too bad. It's not neon, but it's not too bad. Pinky pink. Um, and then... Oh, suction. These are the ones that like your checkpoints matter a whole lot on these people because I've been in a room before where I thought I had suction and I didn't and you're screwed at that point. You want to have like really excellent suction, like set up more than one canister, more than one yonker and make sure they work really, really well. And if possible, um, get a, I don't know what the actual... I only know the proprietary term, but there's a certain type of suction catheter that is much bigger than a yonker. Ours is called a decanto or salad. Um, it, it's just a, it's a big opening. It allows you to suck a huge amount of volume very, very fast. And you can actually put a bougie through it. So you could, you can put it in, suck out, see your view and put your bougie through the, um, through the suction catheter. So it's very, very just clean and easy. So in this really hard to see airway where you may only get glimpses of it because it's like in and out obstructed view and you're sucking, 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 suddenly you have a view, you just shoot it through there. So I love, um, I love, love, love decantos. Um, they're hard to come by. I don't know why it is. I don't know if they're expensive or what the deal is, but this is the one that I would not intimate until they found one or we'd have great options for suction on the backup because the odds that they're going to vomit are pretty high. Although Reglan helps. Um, uh, so that's the suction and then tank them up. So if you have the luxury of time, give them blood, give them some blood beforehand. Because the other thing that will happen with these folks is that if you decompress the belly and you take all this blood off, what happens is that the stomach or the esophagus, wherever the bleeding is at, has filled up with blood and it's tamponaded off whatever place is bleeding. And if you suddenly suck all that blood out, well, now that artery or vein, whatever it is that's bleeding, suddenly has room to start spurting again. So they can drop their blood pressures. So tank them up, give them transfusions, do what you can to correct the bleeding beforehand and have fluids hanging and have pressors around. Because um, <clears throat> these people do often like segue into hemorrhagic shock. Um, Strongly recommend. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. These are the people that, um, you need to paralyze. Now I, there are some of my attendings who don't like to paralyze people. It tends to be the pulmonologist. I cannot stand unless a patient is completely unconscious, like a code situation or a rapid response where they are just not doing nothing. I use a paralytic every single time because I find it very hard to tube someone once they start coughing and gagging. And why put, why do that? Why risk that? I hear people say, well, this way they're not paralyzed. So if I can't get the tube in, they're still breathing. Well, who cares? You've already demonstrated at this point that this patient is sick enough. They have to be intubated. So who cares if they're actually doing a little bit or not? Just put them down, make it so that they're not going to gag, cough, or breathe against you, limiting your ability to get in the airway and worsening the potential outcomes. Just, just paralyze them. I do. I, I don't see the harm in this like other people do, but some people do. I'm sure there's an argument for it, whatever. I'll support that. That's fine. But these people, these people are the ones that will die on the hill if they are getting a paralytic before we tube them because gagging is bad. <laughs> gagging. And as soon as you put something in the mouth, in the back of the posterior pharynx area, they're going to gag. It's just going to happen. So whatever you can do to limit that, just do it. Why wouldn't you do it? 
I say this because clearly I've had this discussion before with an attending and it didn't go well. And ultimately I was like, I'm, I'm going to elect not to do this intubation. I'll be here as your support person. And that, that worked out well for me. That was a good strategy. Um, that person lucked out because they didn't gag, but um, I've seen it. <laughs> here's the thing about being a mid-level. Here's the thing about being mid-level. <sighs> you have something to learn every single day you go to work. I still learn something every single day and I learn from everybody around me, whether it is the person cleaning the trash or the smartest attending in the room. I learn something every day. And I feel like people who have emotional intelligence have the ability to do that. Sometimes physicians lack emotional intelligence. <laughs> so they're never going to be able to learn from someone who is inferior to them. So it's a little bit of a challenge. So as a mid-level, you've got to be a good wife is what I always say. You got to be a good wife. You got to be adaptable. You got to be the head that turns the neck and not the head itself because they want to be the head. They want all the glory. So you got to be able to like, what do you think about adding a paralytic? Aren't you worried about them gagging? Here's the research on it. Sometimes you can do it. Most of the time I can do it. Sometimes I can't just can't. This just is what it is. This is the plight of not being a physician, of being mid-level, and I am okay with that. I'm okay with that. They're assuming the liability and the risk, and if that's what they want to do and that's the risk they're willing to take, then that's okay. I'm going to step back and be your support person. I just can't be the one assuming that risk. That's typically how I handle it. Um, luckily, most of the physicians on the team that I work for give us a lot of autonomy and um, kind of allow us to drive plan of care. I'm very blessed in that way. Um, I've worked other places where it's not like that. And I know a lot, I talk to a lot of NPs, you know, they, they, uh, call me for mentorship or job stuff and they're across the country and I hear stories, y'all. I hear stories. I'm like, this is bad. This is a bad work environment, friend. No, you're not crazy. They're gaslighting you. Get out, get out while you can. Um, we were talking about something. What were we talking about? Oh, vomiting. Okay. And then, oh, yes. Yeah, so we talked about paralytic. You can consider fentanyl. So I worked with a anesthesiologist who's an intensivist and he likes to pre-treat with, um, lidocaine and fentanyl because it will blunt the gag. So you can do that. You certainly can do that. I don't know why I don't think of that, but I should, I should do that more, but I don't. Um, try like heck not to have to bag this patient because again, anytime you push air in the stomach, you fill it up more, there's more pressure and more reason to vomit. The name of the game here is vomit. Vomit is bad. Vomit is bad, bad. Vomit is also very bad for an airway. If you get it down into the airway, the pneumonitis that occurs can make them profoundly hypoxic, especially if it's blood. There's something unique about blood. I don't know what it is. I didn't do any research when I did this article, so I should have, but there's something unique about blood that um, makes the lung airways overly reactive, like super, super reactive, inflammatory. They go on ARDS. Um, so keep blood out of the lung if possible. Um, okay, and then use whatever laryngoscope you want. Okay. This is the one, Alex, I think it was you talking about the glidoscope. So here's my glidoscope story. Um, here, I, I was taught by that same anesthesiologist who built our program, who is um, a guru and very well respected by so many people. But he taught me to intubate and he said, Brianna, you really, it doesn't matter what tool you use to intubate. You need to get good at every single device because particularly when you're in a code situation or you're going out on the floor in these rapids, you never know what blade someone is going to hand you. Like the other day when I needed a McGrath and cause I was on the floor and I couldn't see the cords and all they had were a direct blade. you got to get good at using whatever's handed to you. So, I mean, it's just a tool, right? It's just like anything else. It's just a tool. Um, if you can mitigate risk and develop your technique, it's just a tool. It doesn't matter. But I got in this habit. So I started intubating with McGrath, which is a video assisted laryngoscope. So the technique of intubating is very much a muscle memory thing. Where are you looking? How are you holding your hand? Um, what is the view that you're getting? And a, a McGrath, I'm holding the tube here and I'm looking here. So I'm not looking at their airway here. I'm looking here. A glidoscope, you're not looking here. You're looking up 
which was very hard for me to figure out how to do. I don't know why. A direct blade, you're down close and you're up in the airway. So they're all a little different, but um, I don't prefer them. I don't prefer a glidoscope. And I know that it is a default in a lot of places, particularly where people have a lot of trainees and, and residents. They like to use glidoscopes because you get the clearest picture with a glidoscope. But my problem with the glidoscope is not only the muscle memory of looking up, but say you're looking up and suddenly your view is obstructed because they have a GI bleed. Well, you can get suction and still look there, but the best thing is possible is going to be to have a direct blade where you're literally looking here and shooting through that. And I, you can't quickly switch. That's one thing. The second thing is it's just, it's again, a muscle memory thing for so many years. I've been looking down, looking up is, I don't know. It sounds simple. It's weird to me. The other thing is that blade for a glidoscope is like a horseshoe versus like most of the blades it's it's just one side of a horseshoe you know so getting this whopper of a thing into somebody's mouth if they have a small mouth or they're super dry it's hard to get in i find it very very hard to get in it hyper angulates so it's great for someone who you think is going to be anterior but outside of that i don't like to use it but the picture on my blog post is me intubating with a glidoscope because it was during COVID. We had a locums doctor and he said, Brianna, you know, you really should not be up in their face. Even though you got all this stuff on, you really shouldn't be in their face. You need to be back as far as possible. You're going to use the glidoscope. And I was like, <laughs> but I put that picture on there because it's very telling. Okay. I have a glidoscope in hand. And what am I doing? I'm looking down. I am not looking up at the video monitor. So Use what works for you, use what you are skilled at, but spend some time learning the other techniques so that if you have to in a pinch, you can use them. That's my spiel on what to use. It, it kind of goes back to that. We spend so much time talking about the technique of intubating, who assessing who's going to be a hard intubation and what the risk is. To me, that stuff is lower on the totem pole than sorting out why you have to intubate and fixing those problems like a GI bleed versus because they're all different, right? The GI bleed patient, I treated very differently than the asthma patient. Just knowing what problems, uh, anticipating what problems I'm going to get into and mitigating that risk beforehand to me sets you up for way, way, way better success than just the strategy of what blade am I going to use? What drugs am I going to use? How am I going to get the tube in there? Uh, That's just my take. That's just my thing on it. We spend so much time talking about that, but in reality, what leads to badness is not anticipating why they're in a code. Um, so that's my lecture on that. We're a minute, an hour and 17 minutes into this. Um, and that is the last patient I have. I don't know why I didn't put pulmonary hypertension on there. Uh, I should have, I should have spent a little bit more time on that. Pulmonary hypertension. Those people just suck. <laughs> they just suck because there's other than knowing that they have pulmonary hypertension and this is going to suck. There ain't, there ain't nothing you can do about it. Possibly, possibly you could pre-treat with something like um, inhaled nitric or a milrinone. I've never actually tried that. And I wonder if that would be a good strategy. I'm going to have to do some research on this and make it its own thing. Pulmonary hypertension is one of those, like, I think poorly misunderstood diagnoses. I don't fully, I mean, I, I have like this much of a grasp on it. It's complicated to me, but these people, because it's such a, a complete balance of heart and lung that um, volume status, breathing status, and um, blood flow through the lungs is highly affected by CO2 levels, O2 levels, cardiac pump, um, particularly with pulmonary hypertension. So anyways, these patients, how much volume do they need? Just enough, just enough. Too much, you send them over the edge. Too little, send them over the edge. Anyways, um, that's a little bit of a spiel on pulmonary hypertension. I feel like most ICU patients have pulmonary hypertension. They do. I feel like a lot of them, because so many of them have COPD. There's like five different types of pulmonary hypertension. And I don't remember which one COPD falls in. Like number, th is it pH number three, two? I don't know. My pulmonologist attendings would not be very happy with me right now. <laughs> but um, yeah, a lot of people, because a lot of people smoke still. Um, well, a lot of people of the generation that we see, we're former smokers or still smoking, you know, I feel like younger generations, less of them are smoking. They're vaping, but that's a different thing. Um, okay. Well, that's all I got lecture wise today. Um, I, sorry, I am looking to see, I was going to talk about what I think I want to talk about next week on my blog post. 
I think, I think I'm going to talk about the worst parts of being an NP. <laughs> Actually, you know, my number one top viewed uh, YouTube video is, I think, what is it titled? Um, the unexpected downsides to being a nurse practitioner. It has more views than anything else. <laughs> like people like the negatives. I guess they just want to know like what it's going to, you know, what they're getting into, which I think is wise. As long as you go into things knowing what the potential bad pieces are, then you go in informed, right? Um, so I think possibly I'm going to talk about that. Um, maybe I'll get a chance to work on that tonight. I doubt it though. Although last night at the hospital wasn't bad. We had, it was actually a perfect night to have a student because we had a couple of patients that were fairly sick. So we got to do a lot of teaching. She got some procedures, but it wasn't so overwhelming that I, like I was just running and didn't have time to do some teaching. So she got a good night out of us. I also, I do also need to work on, I've been, I'm working on some coaching packages because I've gotten a, a handful of requests over the years to do like basically tutoring and I hadn't wanted to do it, but I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to. So I'm working on, um, getting that set up. I mean, it's set up, but I'm working on the marketing for it. Um, so if you know anybody in the market for some tutoring, ongoing tutoring and or job acquisition coaching, those are the two things I'm looking at. Um, that would be a great topic. I'm applying to MP school. Congratulations. Where are you? Do you want to share where you're looking at going to school? MP students are my fave. Actually, MPs in general. I like, I like practicing MPs too. Scott going to the eye doctor makes me think I need to go to that. I need to go to the eye doctor. Last night, you know, I have readers everywhere. Last night, my readers fell off my head and broke. And I was like, I can't see. I can't see Jack. I mean, who's got time to go to the doctor, y'all? I guess Scott does. I need to take a number from his page. UC Davis, California. I haven't, I mean, I've heard of that. Like, it does sound familiar to me, but I don't know anything about them. Acute care adult, Jero. Woo, 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 woo. Speaking my language, friend. Believe it or not, I get a lot of the people that come like for um, as clients for me are FNPs, which always kind of surprises me a little. But um, I have a lot to share with them, too. But I love learning from them, like what they're looking at, what's out there job market wise, what they're doing, because there's a lot of FNPs in other places in the country who are working in the hospital. Um, OK, I think that's all I got for you all today. A minute every I think every live I do gets longer and longer. Are you all getting a you're all getting super annoyed with it. Um, I'll try and be concise. Next week will probably be a little shorter because it's it's less heavy. Um, so I will see you next Thursday. We will more than likely talk about reasons why you wouldn't want to be a nurse practitioner. And you might be surprised by what I have to share. Um, so make sure you come in next week, Alex. Thanks for joining us this week. Um, see you later, Mr. Midwife and whoever else is still here. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully it is very helpful to your practice. And I will see y'all next Thursday. Have a good night, y'all. Pray that my night is good tonight.